Working Cows Podcast, Episode 92, Bonus Episode. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Hi everybody, it's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast here with a very special episode. I uh, had the opportunity to sit down with R. Nelson Nash, the founder of the Infinite Banking Concept, the guy who re- literally wrote the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, who has inspired people like Mary Jo Ehrman, who's been a guest a few times, and uh, had an opportunity to sit down with him just before he passed away and record this episode, and I'm really thankful for that opportunity. And these are this is a companion episode with an episode that should be released at the same time as this episode, uh, episode 93 with Carlos Lara. And in this episode, Nel- Nelson is going to plant some seeds of doubt about the official story and so I would encourage you to take this episode as an opportunity to sit down and to just hear from someone who's been uh, immensely studied over the course of his life on these issues. And maybe some of these things are going to be new to you. Maybe some of these history things are going to be uh, fresh perspectives. Um, and I, I would just say that the victor writes the history book. And so sometimes we don't hear every piece of the history. And I would also say that there's an opportunity here for you to do some of your own homework and to hear from Nelson's perspective on history. And so just listen in and maybe some of these names will be new names, or maybe you're familiar with these names and you've got a preformed idea about their ideas. And I would encourage you to maybe look under the surface, look beyond that. And I'm not endorsing or uh, saying that any of the names that Nelson mentions are names that shouldn't be on the list of historians that you are being influenced by. But Nelson's going to take a deep dive here into the deep history of financial trouble in our world. And we're going to follow this up with El Carlos Lara, and we're going to look at the recent history of financial trouble in our world, and maybe even some of the future and how we prepare from financial trouble in our world. So uh, just come at this with an open open mind, uh, do your own homework, read the books that uh, Nelson will encourage you to read. Uh, the show notes page for today going to be a very robust show notes page at workingcows.net slash 92. So I would encourage you to to just sit back, Take this not necessarily as one of those driving or in the tractor or in your shirt pocket while you're out fi- fixing fence episodes. Sit, take this as a, I'm going to turn off the TV tonight. I'm going to listen to this episode. I'm going to take some notes. I'm going to do my own homework. I'm going to make up my own mind about the 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 names and the people that are being listed here. And I'm going to keep an open perspective and not say that the, the corporate media is the one who gets to determine truth, but the actual, there is just one truth that's existent. And, and that truth is discoverable if we're willing to do the work and not just take in uh, the perspective of, of, of others. So uh, maybe we're up to the longest introduction in the history of the Working Cows podcast, but this, this episode is brought to you by the High Plains Ranch Practicum. I had a great conversation with Aaron Berger earlier uh, today, and I want to share that with you in advance of it coming out, because by the time his episode comes out, the uh, the deadline for the registration for the High Plains Ranch practicum will have already passed. And this is some of Aaron's perspective on what makes the High Plains Ranch practicum such a special class and such a special opportunity for those people. I'm really excited about this class. This is going to be the last one that we do really have an excellent lineup of presenters, uh, ranchers who have been in the industry, who are effective and good at what they do. And that together with, I think, the curriculum that we provide really provides a great learning experience. And the camaraderie, exchange of ideas, the opportunity to challenge one another really fosters an environment where I think learning occurs. And so excited about this last High Plains Ranch practicum and would encourage folks if they would like to still participate and they're hearing this podcast, give us a call and if we can get you in, we will. 
All right. So we're going to, I didn't want to interrupt Nelson. Uh, just such a special opportunity to record a, an episode with him uh, before his passing. And this episode, like my episode with Carlos Lara, the companion episode uh, to this episode, is one of those where uh, I want you to stick around at the end. I've, I've got some some things I want to share at the end, uh, just kind of maybe a, a bit of a tribute to uh, our Nelson Nash and his willingness to just to just open up and, and talk to me and allow me to record the conversation and to share it with you guys. So stick around at the end and I'll have some more to share. And uh, here is my interview with R. Nelson Nash of the Nelson Nash Institute. Nelson, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Good to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity. So when you look at the financial and economic landscape of our world today, specifically the United States and its economy. Are you satisfied with its stability and its long-term sustainability? Oh, heavens no. There's no way. Um, It's just one of those things that's, that's there that we've got to cope with. And people have got to recognize what's going on and learn how to seize it from the system. Uh, you don't uh, do that uh, politically. You do that individually. That's what uh, uh, people, uh, unfortunately, don't understand. What is it that causes you to believe that there are issues in our current economic system? Well, uh, it boils down to money, Pastor. Uh, it's just the fact that we cannot live the way that we live without the concept of money. Uh, unfortunately, it's in the hands of the wrong people, uh, bankers. Uh, there is truly evil there, but people do not understand the evil nature of it. What is it that they are doing to or with the money that is causing the issues that you see in the system? They're causing people to be slaves. That's that's all. But uh, these things happen over such a long period of time that people don't see it happening to them. And that's why the article by Paul Rosenberg is so apropos that uh, uh, people are not conscious of the environment in which they uh, operate. And as a result, they're being manipulated into uh, slavery, financial slavery. Uh, the, the banking function is in the hands of the wrong people. And it can uh, people can secede from it, but uh, they've got to uh, understand uh uh, that they can't do it by thinking that the way the world teaches. And that I think I'm I'm free to link to that uh, at the show notes page. Mm-hmm. I'm free to link to that uh, article that you sent me from Paul Rosenberg. Oh, yes. By, by all means. That stuff is all going to be linked at workingcows.net slash 92. I'll throw a link Good to that, that article up there and uh, people can go and, and read that and and mm-hmm. basically it's it's making the argument that we've been in this same system for so long that we don't realize that we're in the system yeah it's the nature of human beings but uh, that's that's the fundamental there that is overlooked that, that we're born with a proclivity to reject God right what is the current system that we live under as far as economics and finance are concerned what is the what are the characteristics of that system oh it's the epitome of the of the top down uh, bit that's going on in fact you cannot understand the last 135 years of the uh of our uh, current history without understanding the mind of uh, Cecil Rhodes but uh, who ever, who's ever heard of Cecil Rhodes huh <laughs> Can you tell me more about how Cecil Rhodes can help us inform our understanding of the last 135 years? Sure. We're talking about the 1880s, 1890s, and we're talking about uh, the influence of uh, John Ruskin. Uh, He was an art critic uh, and uh, philosopher and so forth, and people were just enamored with what he had to say, and he influenced Cecil Rhodes big time. Yeah, Cecil Rhodes was a very rich man, and uh, uh, he, uh, he's down in South Africa. And uh, the British Empire was the uh, Brit was the uh, at its peak at that particular time, and uh, he thought the British Empire was the greatest thing that ever happened. And there had to be a secret elite that actually ran things. That it wasn't government; it had to be uh, the money powers. 
And so uh, there's five people that had to cover all the bases. Uh, of course, there was Cecil Rhodes. You know, he featured himself as head guy. Well, he only lived in 1902, but uh, Alfred Milner was his successor in Horton and Eagle. Man, that guy was good grief. But uh, whoever, yeah, again, has heard of him? Well, the one they have heard of is Nettie Roth- Rothschild. Well, uh, there's money. And uh, then there's W.T. Stead, and Stead was a newspaper man, and uh, that's where the propaganda idea becomes in play, that uh, uh, you got to control uh, people's minds by propaganda. And most of the stuff that we have going on out there today is nothing but pure, unadulterated propaganda. And, of course, then, then there's the uh, connection with government, and that was... Uh, Hmm, let's see, Lord Escher. Now uh, he had another name, but they, they, he got it got changed to Lord Escher, and he had the uh, uh, he, all the uh, attention of the royalty of uh, of uh, England, and uh, so they had all the bases covered there, and uh, so we end up with the bloodiest century of all time as a result of this. And it all has to do with money. Money is the kind is the common denominator. Uh, and so, uh, uh, have you ever heard of the Boer War, Pastor? I don't believe so. Oh boy! All right, B O E R. I knew there was a Boer War, but um, I I didn't know what it was about, or anything like that at all. And so, about fourteen months ago, I just was determined to find out what. The the Boers were uh, Dutch farmers. Uh, they were down in South Africa for over 200 years. Well, you uh, ever heard of Kimberley uh, uh, in South Africa, the uh, diamond mines, gold mines, and so forth? Mm-hmm. You heard of De Beers? Right. Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, so uh, anyway, and. We, we, we've got to go to the Tenth Commandment uh, out there to really understand all this, to understand the mind of old uh, Cecil Rhodes. Uh, the British Empire was, like you see, he thought that was the greatest thing that ever came along. Well, uh, if you're king of the mountain, Pastor, uh, what do you think your biggest fear is, sir? Getting toppled. Yes. Well, the Germans were coming along very well. Germany, as we know it today, is only uh, 1871. Before that, it was fragmented into uh, uh, various uh, areas, and but they all came together then, 1871. Well, uh, it was high-quality pro- products and uh, low prices and so forth and threatened the British Empire. Well, as a satellite... Uh, you must understand that all the royalty of all those various nations there in Europe, uh, they were related. Mm. And when you when you step back and see what was going on out there, there could never have been a, a world war without uh, the British Empire. It, it was impossible. There's no such thing in the past, but the, British, the uh, whole 20th century is... Uh, the bloodiest century of all time, and it all comes from the uh, uh, the envy uh, thing there, the fear that uh, the uh, Germans is going to take over, and so uh, the Boer War was just simply to do one thing to get it, uh, money to get going. Well, back then in the eighteen eighties, uh, they went uh, the British went down there to clean out those Boers and get to that uh, area, the Transvaal area, where all the uh, the richest spot on earth uh, was was there. Well, uh, the, uh, the British got their tails beat big time. Uh, they weren't used to that kind of war. This was, that was humiliating the British Empire. Okay, so uh, they, they come back in 1901 and 1902 with another method. They um, captured uh, Boer women and children and put them in uh, concentration camps, Pastor. 
Now, I'm 88 years old. I'm a product of a World War II area uh, era. You know, we were taught by the propaganda machine that was just unbelievable that uh, the bad guys was those Germans out there that created those concentration camps and so forth. And the truth was, it was the British. But again, uh, our, our history books are certainly not going to tell us this sort of stuff because, you see, the secret elite controls uh, education in this country, in, in the world. The secret elite controls uh, the media totally. I haven't watched the news in uh, over 18 months, and I refuse to do so because it's not news. It's propaganda totally. Well, uh, so uh, that uh, next uh, eight years, uh, we end up with... Uh, the propaganda machine uh, by W.T. Stead that uh, was convincing the British that the Germans are going to invade them. And that was absurd. There's no way. But uh, uh, that's why propaganda is so important. It's almost as uh, valuable as having money. But uh, by all means, if you're going to fight a war, you got to have lots of money. Okay, so uh, let's see what happened here. Uh, at the end of 1902, uh, Cecil Rhodes dies and so forth, and W.T. Stead is doing his thing with propaganda. And guess what happened in um, uh, 1910 at Jekyll Island, Georgia, you know? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, now, uh, there had to be a central uh, bank there and so forth, and uh, the Rockefellers, the Morgan, the Warburg, Paul Warburg, uh, was straight out of the house of Rothschild, straight out of the house of King Loeb, uh, Wall Street, and so forth, and he was the architect of the document that became the uh, Federal Reserve. Well, most people, uh, again, say, well, that was in America. Well... People don't understand that these uh, secret elite folks uh, don't have nationalities. They're they're above all this sort of stuff. You know, uh, have you ever heard of a guy named Carol Quigley? I don't think so. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, He wrote this book, Tragedy and Hope, uh, 1,347 pages, I believe. I've heard of the book. Uh, He was... Okay, he's a great uh, uh, historian and so forth. And he was the guy who was the, uh, influenced Bill Clinton more than anybody. Now, uh, when you hear of a Rhodes Scholar, uh, tell me what comes to your mind, Pastor. When you hear somebody say, oh, he's a Rhodes Scholar, what comes to your mind? Smart. Uh, yeah. Well, uh <laughs> It was a training camp. What he really is is a training camp for the secret elite type folks. Uh, people don't get this sort of stuff in schools, but again, because they're totally controlled by the uh, uh, the, the secret elite. But Carol Quigley is a guy that uh, put us on to so much of this way back there, and he get had a horrible time getting that first book uh, written. And then his follow-up book was much smaller, but it was the uh, idea of the Anglo-American uh, uh, establishment. As a sidelight, I uh, did not put into my uh, earlier conversation with you there that Cecil Rhodes uh, saw that uh, the uh, uh, we need that England had to recapture America, the USA. Hmm. Well. Uh, if you study this sort of stuff, you'll find out that uh, that's just about what's been done. Hmm. Uh, but people aren't aware of this sort of thing at all. Well, uh, so here's the thing. We're back to Jekyll Island, Georgia, 1910, and uh, they uh, do all their groundwork, and it's, uh, this uh, document becomes law. The last week of um, December 1913, okay, mm-hmm. between Christmas and uh, New Year's Day, when most of the legislators were out of town and so forth, and they were totally illegal, but it got done. Well, Pastor, next week is uh, 1914, isn't it? Mm-hmm. 
Well, guess what happened just eight months later? The guns of August, World War I. <clears throat> See, uh, there's a couple of books uh, that uh, go into this big time, and uh, one of them is The Hidden uh, Secret of the Origin of uh, World War I. Now, the authors of that's Jim McGregor and uh, uh, Gary Dockery, and uh, they had a dickens of time getting that thing published uh, because uh, it was uh, so revealing of uh, the, the, the the bad stuff that had gone on. Well, uh, later on, they wrote the, a follow-up book, Prolonging the Agony, that uh, when World War One started, there wasn't any reason for it to extend longer than six months. All the British and the French had to do was uh, just simply uh, uh, knock out the German uh, ironworks and it's over, but that's not the object. The object was to totally destroy German people. Hmm. And so uh, it went on for three and a half years. Have you ever heard of a place called Gallipoli? No, sir. Well, you have heard of Constantinople. Yes, sir. You know where the Black Sea is? Yes, sir. You know where the Mediterranean is? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, there's one little narrow waterway there between the two, and that's the Constantinople. Well, uh, and all this uh, chicanery that was going on, the, uh, the uh, Russians had been lusting after Constantinople for over 200 years. Uh, I remember as a child uh, in, uh, talk, uh, the uh, talk about Constantinople and uh, uh, that waterway and so forth that the, the British, uh, Chucks, the Russians wanted to do so badly. Well, Gallipoli is a peninsula uh, in the Dardanelles just south of there. Now, uh, the uh, British Empire was all built on the the naval abilities and so forth. Uh, as far as army, you know, they, they weren't all that uh, uh, note, noteworthy, we'll put it that way. Okay, so uh, uh, the Russians are uh, wanting the, the Constantinople and the British Empire tells them, now, uh, don't you worry, uh, we'll... Uh, We'll uh, conquer uh, Constantinople and uh, the Dar and the Dardanelles and Gallipoli, and we'll give it to you. Well, that was all a, a, a hoax, just to keep them uh, get get them involved in the war, because they wanted a war on either side of Germany uh, there to kill as many Germans as they possibly could. Well. It was a tragedy to the British. Uh, and this was Churchill's uh, uh, one of his big, big mistakes, big time. And when you study that guy, what an evil fellow he was. But most folks have no earthly idea. We made him an honorary citizen. But when you find out what he was really like, my word, uh, you talking about the epitome of the um, uh, secret elite? There you go. Well. Uh, you know, most people, people never heard of Gallipoli, but uh, you can go to YouTube and just uh, uh, write in Gallipoli, and there's several uh, videos there that uh, help you understand and uh, and so forth. Well, uh, later on, uh, uh, during that uh, 19, uh, I shucks, the First World War, uh, down in what is now Iraq, uh, there's a place called Kut, K-U-T, and that was an even bigger uh, disaster for the British. But what people uh, really don't understand is that most of the fighting at uh, Gallipoli and uh, Kut and so forth was by Indians, uh, Australians, New Zealanders, and Canadians and folks like that. That's why people don't understand that there could never have been a world war without the British Empire. Hmm. Well, uh, back in November the 11th, we celebrated a holiday, didn't we? Yes, sir. What was it? Well, it used to be called Armistice Day. Now it's called Veterans Day. 
Uh huh. You, have you noticed how they change the meaning of words out there to uh, give it more uh, acceptability, I guess, or something like that? Armistice, they laid down their arms. Mm-hmm. Well, <clears throat> that wasn't the end of the war. Uh, there was a, a peace that the peace treaty with the Versailles Treaty. Uh, do you know anything about the Versailles Treaty? Yeah, it really uh, messed with the Germans. <laughs> Good boy. Uh, even uh, uh, Wilson said that, uh, that if he had been a German, he would never have signed that thing. It was an awful, awful uh, instrument that just tried to pin the blame on Austria, on Germany and Austria, which wasn't true at all. The actual start uh, was started by the Russians uh, under the influence of the British to manipulate these folks. Uh, that they go, had France on one side that they were manipulating. They had uh, Russia on the other side there, and that was the ideal that they thought. Well, what uh, our history books won't tell you is that uh, is eight months, I believe it is, that uh, between the Armistice Day and uh, the uh, Versailles Treaty. Well, during that time, the uh, uh, British blockaded all the German the ports, and they were starving to death. I mean, we're talking about a thousand calories per day hmm. as being typical. Well, it takes seventeen hundred to uh, to survive, but the idea was to kill as many uh, Germans as they possibly could. Well, uh, uh, so ultimately, you you had uh, World War Two, which there were past that there wasn't two world wars. There was one war with the recess there. That was all. <laughs> that is all. Yes, sir. About nine years later, uh, here comes the uh, beginning of everything and so forth. And uh, they created Hitler. Is what happened? Really happened? But, uh, who knows that? Uh, they don't study. Uh, they they read the uh, so-called history books or whatever. But uh, there's a uh, real good historian out there that's on YouTube called David Irving, uh, R-V-I-N-G. And uh, he says uh, most of the history books is uh, is a guy sitting in an ivory tower, and he pulls down this particular history book and reads it, and he pulls down another one and reads it, and then he pulls down another one and reads that, and then maybe a fourth or fifth, and then he writes his own book, and so that's history. Well, he he calls it uh, uh, hmm, intellectual incest. Hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, uh, David Irving uh, went to these places in uh, Germany. David Irving was three years younger than me. He grew up in um, uh, London. And uh, so forth. And uh, if it weren't for him, we would never have really known about Dresden and so forth. But uh, have you have, have you spent any time in Europe at all? A little bit, yes, sir. Okay, you've been to Cologne. Nope, I've only been to spent time on the ground in Ukraine mainly. Okay, well, you do know about the cathedral there in Cologne, right? Mm-hmm. Other than the cathedral, uh, that city was leveled. Well, several other cities that were leveled. Now, I remember very vividly uh, during my growing up time. See, I was a teenager during uh, World War II. Uh, there was the constant uh, use of the term unconditional surrender. Well, so we end up we we uh, come up with the uh, second edition of the war there the uh, what's World War Two. All right, uh, at the end of World War Two, have you ever heard of Eisenhower's Ryan Meadows death camps? No, sir. Well, Google it. <laughs> Eisenhower's Ryan Meadows death camps, the Rhine River. A meadow has no cover at all. There were more German uh, soldiers killed after the war was over than during the war. Hmm. Now, what most folks don't know is that uh, that uh, it wasn't Eisenhower's idea so much as it was 
Henry Morgenthau. Have you ever heard of him? Yes, sir. What an evil man. All right. The, the Morgenthau plan was to uh, uh, make a pasture land out of Germany. No industry would be allowed. Well, uh, you see, um, so here's uh, Mr. Churchill saying, oh, no, that, that would be inhumane. Uh, and so forth, so we, we can't do that. But somehow or another, uh, $6 billion uh, from the United States to Churchill uh, changed his mind. Well, the Morgenthau plan didn't get fully implemented, but uh, that was the whole idea more than anything else. But uh, again, do you know of anybody who knows about Eisenhower's de- Ryan Meadows death camps? I had never heard of it. Well, uh, I have a very good friend uh, who's a, uh, a doctor in um, Texas. Uh, uh, shucks, I can't remember the t- name of the town, but it's real close to a real bitty, little bitty town, Alvarado, which is south of uh, Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. And uh, doc- Dr. Eb Lamb uh, Samlowski, German. Uh, he had a brother who was also a doctor, but his fa- their father was a, uh, a German doctor, and he survived one of those uh, uh, death camps. Hmm. Well, you see, that's real history, but who in the world would be uh, talking about Sam Lowski in a history book, huh? Hmm. Because that's not done, so forth. Well, but the uh, the, the common denominator of all this is money, because that's where the power is. Well, you can secede from this by something called free contract with other free people. The law of contract prevails, but people don't understand that. Uh, uh, consider, uh, shucks, uh, consider uh, fish of the last to notice the water. All that years of uh, top-down thinking and uh, 4,000 of the 6,000 years is in the Old Testament. Well, there is uh, 400 years between the Old and the New Testament in there. Mm-hmm. But how many uh, people that are Christians don't understand that the New Testament is only covering about 75 years? Right. And really, it's only covering about 45 because uh, the 30 years of Jesus Christ growing up is not all that, uh, okay, uh, noted in history. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, uh, so Jesus Christ comes along with bottom up thinking. Mm-hmm. When you go through that uh, litany that uh, DeSoto wrote there, you know. Jesus Christ gets uh, baptized, and uh, he's uh, going to be starting his mission. He knows he's got a job to do. He's fully man, and he's fully God. Well, there's the period of temptation there, 40 days and 40 nights. Well, who's out there with him? Satan. Now, Satan as a spirit has been around for a long time. Jesus Christ as a human being has all been around 20, 30 years. So I can imagine this kind of scenario uh, that uh, Satan is kind of saying to him, now, look, that boy, to pull off this mission that you got, you got to impress people. Hmm. Now, we've been out here 40 days and 40 nights. Aren't you hungry? Well, good grief, man. Just turn these rocks into stone, uh, these stones into bread. Uh, That will impress people. Get thee behind me, Satan. Hmm. Then he takes him out there to the uh, high uh, brow of uh, a high point, so he shows him all these nations. He says, all those nations out there are mine. They are bought into my camp 100%. They are my slaves. Now, all you got to do is bow down and worship me, and I'll give them to you. Can't you see how easy that is? <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan. And then lastly, uh, he says, now, look, boy, when you get back to town, uh, find the highest spot in the temple. And uh, uh, you're looking down on all those people down there, and they're looking up at you. Just dive off. 
swan dive, make it look beautiful. You're not going to get hurt, and you know it. Angels will rescue you. That will totally impress them. Well, Pastor, you think that's going to change the hearts of men? Hmm. No. No way. No, it's got to be bottom up. Now, is there any evidence in the New Testament where Jesus Christ makes a decision that, you know, what I really need to do is go get affiliated with those Pharisees and Sadducees, get me a Ph.D. under Gamaliel like uh, Paul did? (laughs) (laughs) No, it can't work. That's more the top-down thinking that uh, Paul Rosenberg is alluding to uh, so forth. It has to be bottom up. Uh, Jesus Christ is teaching cessation. <laughs> Don't play their game. If you play their game, you're one of them. Well, uh, you know, the Pharisees are not even mentioned uh, until the New Testament. That's a fairly short period of time. Well, uh, here's old Paul, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, he says, nobody got any higher than me. Uh, and he's mm-hmm. on road to Damascus, and you know what happened. Mm-hmm. The, the confrontation with, with, with uh, Jesus Christ. Well, boy, that's got to be <laughs> something. Not the living daylights out of him. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it took him uh, more than 10 years to get his head screwed on right. Right. And it, and did you notice what he did uh, when he uh, finally was uh, understanding that uh, what Jesus Christ was getting across to him? Of all things, he goes back down there to Jerusalem and uh, finds those Pharisees and essentially says, hey, guys, we got it all wrong. Look at what I found out. <laughs> hmm. Well, do you think those guys are going to change their mind? Good Lord, heavens no. <laughs> well, I got a feeling that uh, shucks, uh, Joseph of Arimathea uh, might have come around, <laughs> and uh, there was uh, Nicodemus that he probably came around and whatnot. Mm-hmm. I, might, I might get to meet him in the not too distant future. Those guys <laughs> in the not too distant future. <laughs> But uh, look at First Corinthians, uh, first chapter. You know where Corinth is, of course you do. Mm-hmm. New Orleans on oh, no, those <laughs> steroids. <laughs> <laughs> All those crazy beliefs and so forth. And so uh, here's Paul uh, and uh, others with him that are trying to get this message across that. Uh, you got this thing all wrong, that it's the blood of Jesus Christ uh, that, uh, that uh, is, is our salvation, that uh, sin is separation from God. Mm. And uh, we have this natural proclivity to, uh, to uh, stray from God and so forth. But uh, uh, the wages of sin, being away from God, is death. Yes. All right, now, man is so stupid that he is doomed without understanding that. So the, uh, the, all those thousands of years have demonstrated his stupidity, that he, that he wants to be God. And uh, God is a jealous God. Uh, he's not going to put up with that stuff. Uh, so the price has got to be paid. Jesus Christ is the only way out. Mm-hmm. The belief. Well, that's a totally different concept. All right, so what in the world did they do? Uh, here's uh, these people uh, saying, oh, man, uh, I'm a Paul. Oh, no, no, I'm of a Paul or so forth. They were concentrating on men rather than message. Mm-hmm. And Paul got on got on big time, didn't he? Mm-hmm. He said, uh, uh, I preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that is all. Mm-hmm. But human beings have a tendency to worship one another. 
Rosenberg nails it in that uh, two page pages. Yes, sir. But people can't recognize it. So, but uh, in order to pull off all this stuff, it's always money. Mm-hmm. It is common to now and later. <clears throat> and so, was Ruskin's idea central planning? Was that what he was angling towards? Oh, good. Oh, oh, yes. No question. Yeah. And then, yeah. so out of Ruskin's ideas and Cecil Rhodes and all those, we get the uh, yes. the central bank out of Jekyll Island, oh, yeah. Georgia. Uh, yeah, uh, you see the, uh, the the Jekyll Island, Georgia thing there, that eight months. Uh, you, they knew they had been knowing for over 10 to 14 years they were going to have that war with uh, Germany. They knew. Well, they got to have tons of money. And so uh, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, created an uh, open-ended supply of money. Just consider what's happened during my lifetime. Good grief. Uh, the quantity of money it isn't solving things at all. I, uh, hmm. Okay. We don't, my family is not noted for money, okay? Uh, we were poor as church mice, as they say. Whatever we were rich in uh, in understanding of who's who in the play, and I became a Christian when I was nine years old because I could, I knew something was wrong out there big time. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, uh, when I was out of college, I had two years of active duty with the Air Force because I was a ROTC student. Pastor, do you know what a second lieutenant's base pay was in 1952? No, sir. $213.75 a month, every month, whether you needed it or not. (laughs) $75 uh, a housing allowance, $42 uh, food allowance. And do you know we got along very well on that? Mm. It's not a quantity of money out there at all. But you see, when they open the floodgates out here, guess who runs the show? Hmm. Bankers. So how does the, well, I mean, a lot of what you've talked about this morning is related to our situation today. The central planning, the uh, debasement of the German money supply, and the Weimar Republic happening between yep. World War One and World War Two, and yep. you know, I mean, I was listening to a, a deal the other day, and it talked about the the Weimar Republic and how uh, this one guy had sixty eight thousand dollars or sixty eight thousand marks in his savings account, and yep. they uh, came to him and said, "We've got to liquidate your account, but we can't." Uh, give you your money because the the smallest mark being printed right now is a million marks, and so <laughs> right, we've yeah. we've rounded up your account to a million. So that's good news. Yep. But the but the the stamp that was on the letter that they sent to him was a five yep. million mark stamp. So he was in the hole four million marks, and <laughs> and at that time a loaf of bread was however million many million marks. So how does how does the central planning and the debasement of money and all of that relate to where we are today? Well, uh, you know, this is a, we have a hostile financial environment out there, but uh, I've been teaching for the last 30 years uh, that uh, you can uh, uh, do very well. You can survive and thrive in a hostile financial in- environment with free contract with other free people. You know, face it, that uh, without the law of contracts, civilization will will self-destruct. Hmm. And uh, well, uh, let's go back to biblical times there, good grief. Uh, God made contracts with these people, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, covenants. Well, yes. Well, the same contract uh, applies today. Uh, if you believe. But so many Christians can't. To uh, recognize the word if. Hmm. Yeah, we're promised uh, eternal life, but uh, it's if. And they can't understand that uh, this earthly existence is nothing more than training camp for the eternal. Hmm. 
it takes us a while to get our stupid heads on straight and realize who's who in the play. <laughs> Shakespeare, I keep telling people in seminars that I've done, he gave us a clue uh, years ago. He said, all the world is the stage and all the people are actors of their own. I say, well, taking a hint from him, uh, <laughs> most people don't understand what the play is about. Mm-hmm. Worse than that, they get the characters in the play mixed up. They think they're God. <laughs> that's been the lie since that, the beginning. That's, that's the problem right there. Just learning how to secede from what's going on out there by free contract with other free people, uh, that's the only answer. So how does somebody go about seceding from the money system in our world today? There's one instrument out there that uh, that meets this totally, and that's dividend pay and whole life life insurance. But Again, who knows that, huh? <laughs> but I have spent uh, uh, 35 years now trying to get this across to people. And, uh, well, all of these people that I've taught this to and so forth, uh, they uh, say, uh, you changed my life. No, I did not. They changed their life. <laughs> That, uh, okay, this analogy will help out. Uh, I'm an aviator. Did you know that? No, sir. Okay, I've been flying airplanes 72 years. <laughs> I've sold when I was four, uh, 15 years old. It wasn't legal, but as the end of World War II, and there's a lot of things you would done that weren't legal. <laughs> and so forth. Well, anyway, <clears throat> I'm a forester by education. And uh, I work privately in Eastern North Carolina for uh, uh, nine years uh, as a consultant. I never worked for the government. Smokey Bear and I don't see eye to eye on much of anything. But um, anyway, uh, I got active in Chamber of Commerce Act uh, work and so forth. Smithfield was... The North Carolina was 12,000 uh, people at that time, and uh, I became president of the chamber uh, once while I was living there. Well, being an aviator, I uh, was able, okay, I had the privilege of selecting who's going to be the speaker at our annual meeting. Uh, being an aviator, uh, I picked William Piper, Piper Aircraft. And uh, I'm 30 years old, and he's 74. Well, what a joy to spend time with a man like that and just, you know, learn some wisdom and so forth. But uh, one message he did get across to our, our chamber, uh, hopefully. Uh, he sure got it across to me. He says, you have a telephone. Big deal. If somebody else doesn't have a telephone, you don't have a thing. Hmm. <laughs> so let's extrapolate that, Pastor. Hmm. You you may have the greatest message in the world, and we know what that is, okay? Yes. Now, <clears throat> you may have the best means of communication available. You may have the best delivery of that message through that superior means of communication. But if you don't have an attentive listener, nothing happens. Inherently, mostly, like Rosenberg points out there at one point of his uh, two pages, uh, inherently, uh, most folks have a feeling something's wrong. Like I say, I recognized that when I was just nine years old. Something is wrong. <laughs> that uh, that we, We've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one solution out there, and that's all, and that is Jesus Christ. Hmm. Amen. So how do you think the infinite banking concept will perform in the next financial crisis? Well, if you get enough people uh, that understand this, you have a tipping point out there. You get 10% of the people understanding that this is true, uh, then it becomes normal behavior. It, it goes viral. Uh, there's uh, all kind of proof out there that that's, that is true. But you don't have to have everybody doing it. That's just it. A- as a result of my teaching uh, and practicing what I've been teaching, my wife and I and my family, I have three children, uh, ten grandchildren, nine greats, and a tenth one on the way. 
And uh, within our family, uh, we haven't seen a bank in over 30 years. Hmm. You see, people say, you don't have a checking account? Of course they have a checking account, but that's not banking. Good grief. Classify things correctly. That's accounting. <laughs> that's not banking. Banking is loans. Hmm. And you see, banks are lending money that doesn't exist, and that is fraud, and that is evil to the core. Right. But people don't recognize that because the secret elite keep it from them. They're not about to tell you that they lend money that doesn't exist. So how did you come to be using this system? Well, again, I became a Christian, as I told you, when I was nine. Now, uh, I am very, and I'm a forester by education, but the first year of college, uh, there's those basic courses. I am very proud of the fact that I made a a D-plus in uh, economics, (laughs) 101. Now, that's Delta Plus. It's not Bravo Plus, okay? (laughs) That way, I didn't have so much nonsense to wash out of my brain. (laughs) And so when when I got up the Air Force in uh, uh, 54, went to work in eastern North Carolina, uh, Johnson County, uh, North Carolina, is tobacco country. That's the second largest tobacco county in the world. Well, at the time that I moved there in 1954, uh, things were quite different. Uh, And uh, tobacco was a commodity that was tightly controlled by the by the government folks, whatever. Now you could only uh, you were only allowed to plant so much tobacco based on your open land that you had. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well. Tell me, uh, then, what would every tobacco farmer do when they planted uh, tobacco? They overplanted, mm-hmm. didn't they? Yes, sir. And nobody had to tell you that, did you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So they had an army of uh, people that, uh, working for the county, uh, would go out to your tobacco farm and measure off how much you had overplanted and make you destroy that. Hmm. Now, because that was the biggest uh, uh, money producer in that county, that kind of thinking spilled over into uh, uh, the general economy. Hmm. Well, uh, I immediately ran into the, uh, being a Christian, I said, this doesn't square with my Christian upbringing at all. Hmm. This is crazy. And uh, so here I am mouthing off at a social, social, social gathering at the home of this radiologist <clears throat> and um, about what I run into. He says, sound like you need to read this book. Went back to his library, got Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. Have you read that? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm aware of the <laughs> concepts, yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, so I read it in less than 10 days. I've got it back in his hands, and I said, I have two questions. Where well, you guys been hiding this stuff? <laughs> and the second question, why did you hide it from me? <laughs> he says, well, if you like what you read, get on this mailing list of this journal called The Freeman, put out by the Foundation for Economic Education, Irvington, New York. He says, now, all you got to do is ask for it. Now, uh, they're supported entirely by donations, and they will never ask you for money. But if you aren't throwing some money in a year's time, they just take you off the money list. That's all this, too. Well, faster, the more I read, the better it got. And uh, I became particularly drawn to the writings of Leonard E. Reed. Now, Leonard E. Reed, uh, uh, his Last occupation was the president of the Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest chamber of commerce, Los Angeles, California. And through a series of incidents, uh, he was uh, led to create uh, the Foundation for Economic Education along with Henry Hazlitt. There were about five other guys there, but uh, Leonard was the driving force. And if it weren't for Leonard Reed, we would 
uh, we wouldn't know Austrian economics as we know it today. Hmm. Because, you see, it was his influence that, uh, well, Menger started the uh, Austrian school. And Eugene Bombay work was uh, one of his uh, successors, but the real hero that came along was Ludwig von Mises. I guess you know about him. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, Mises, uh, he could debunk the nonsense of socialism so fast he would make your head swim. <laughs> and uh, he had two things against him when the Nazis were coming into Vienna. First of all, he was Jewish, but the second thing is uh, he could he, he could see through socialism and explain it so well that they wanted to kill him. <clears throat> hmm. Well, he and uh, Margaret put whatever they could in suitcases and escaped into uh, Switzerland for a period of time, but they were still after him. And they didn't want to be a burden to the uh, Swiss, so uh, they made contact with Henry Hazlitt mm. at Foundation for Economic Education back uh, before the World War One was really get World War Two was getting started big time. And so Mises made that his his uh, point of uh, operation for the rest of his life. Now later on. Uh, uh, 35 years ago, the Mises Institute got started by Lou Rockwell. Lou Rockwell used to be uh, the head of uh, uh, he, the, the uh, director of seminars at Foundation of Economic mm-hmm. Education. But uh, anyway, it's located down at Auburn, Alabama. It's not part of Auburn University. But uh, you see, here's the tragedy. That, uh, there is this uh, state uh, university. They, uh, 99% of the people in Auburn don't have an idea that the Mises Institute is located there, but it has worldwide influence, and these are friend, uh, very close friends of mine. But uh, Leonard E. Reed was my personal friend and mentor. Hmm. Uh, I learned more from that guy than anybody ever. And all of his writings are available through Foundation for Economic Education, now located in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Hmm. And uh, yours yours truly is a uh, charter member of the Leonard E. Reed Society. There's only uh, 100 of us in the world. Hmm. And so I uh, I take pride in that very much. But uh, only the Austrians have got it right. there's the mate, the uh, shucks, the uh, Keynesian fools out there. My number two man was uh, Clarence Carson. Clarence was a uh, historian, but he wrote from an economic point of view and was a uh, native of here in Alabama. I met him through Foundation for Economic Education, and my wife and I worked with him for some 22 years uh, before he died. And Dr. Paul Cleveland is here in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'll be having lunch with him here shortly hmm. today. Anyway, uh, through, I met Paul through Foundation for Economic Education, and uh, it wasn't too long before I'd uh, drawn him into the support group for Dr. Clarence Carson. And uh, Clarence Carson was the one who taught Paul how to write books. The three of us became such good friends that when uh, Clarence died, uh, Paul and I got to conduct his funeral. So Mm. God is God is good. Mm. Anyway, then uh, there's the other school out there. There's the Chicago school. You know about Milton Friedman? Yes, sir. Well, people consider him to be a uh, a free market economist, but uh, no, he's a monetarist. There's got to be that constant increase in the money supply. So there we are right back to the central bank idea and so forth. Yeah. Mm. Uh, only the Austrians got it right because it's bottom-up thinking. It's not top-down thinking. This is, is a big book was entitled uh, Human Action. Mm-hmm. And uh, it has to do with human be- individual behavior, not group thinking not group thinking. right? And so you see how that is perfectly attuned with the Christian belief. Hmm. That it doesn't matter what other people are doing out 
uh, there. What matters is do I have a personal relationship with a fellow named Jesus Christ? Mm, amen. And I can't do it for my children. I can't do it for anybody that I know. They've got to make that decision themselves. And so that's the uniqueness of the Austrian school. It's bottom-up thinking. Can you give a summary of how uh, Keynesian economics and uh, the central planning and the central banking leads to issues in the money supply and leads to issues in the economy more broadly? Well, you see, uh, the uh, the thing that I started out there with Cecil Rhodes and so forth, uh, that's just the epitome of Keynesian thinking, you see. Uh, Keynes came from that particular elite group in the, the British Empire, hmm. and none of it made real sense at all, but uh, it's amazing how people are attracted to nonsense. We don't have to look very far to notice that that's true. So uh, the increase in the money supply there is a means of uh, controlling people's minds, and uh, the the bankers know that the best, the biggest, the easiest way for them to make lots of money is wars. Hmm. You gotta have wars, and you gotta have wars. You gotta have lots of money, hmm. but. This doesn't register, again, because they control the thinking of uh, human beings that, uh, well, i put it this way, Pastor. My observation in these 88 years, and from what I've told you so far, is that uh, one of the biggest problems is Christians abandoned the responsibility of teaching their kids about 1860 and this mm. uh, 50 in this country, and they turned it over to the devil. <laughs> well, homeschoolers out there today is big time. I had a, just a chance meeting here about oh, four months ago. I was getting my hair cut by this young uh, uh, lady, uh, and uh, I found out that uh, she was a homeschooler, and her father was a pastor, and she has 11 siblings, and they're all homeschooled and such. Hmm. Well, uh, you see, when Mary and I were working with Dr. Uh, Clarence Carson, uh, the historian, uh, we worked big time with homeschoolers, and uh, it should never be called homeschooling. See, uh, people get the idea that... Uh, Homeschooling is mama sitting around the kitchen table with the kids. No, it should be called market schooling. <laughs> Any resource out there. You see, uh, you, I told you I was an aviator, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've been around the life insurance business for 55 years now. And uh, several years ago, I had an associate uh, who's younger and he, well, his, his boy was uh, 13, I believe, and being homeschooled. Well, uh, my uh, associate and I uh, have a client to go see down in Louisiana. And so we take the boy along. Well, I've taught the uh, my associate how to fly the airplane. And uh, so here I am teaching him geography Timber types, land uh, types, uh, explaining meandering streams, uh, why are certain people in this particular area, so forth. That's, that's market schooling. Hmm. Any resource out there. It doesn't have to be, be you know, people think that they've got to uh, have a diploma of some sort. Do you know who Walter E. Williams is? Yes, sir. All right. I've been knowing Walter 32 years. Uh, what a fun guy he is, and so forth. He says, half the kids in college should never have been there. Hmm. Yeah. And you you notice that uh, what happened uh, at the end of World War II, uh, here's all these uh, soldiers and sailors and whatnot coming off of active duty. Millions. 
And the socialists who were in charge at that time says, oh, that's going to ruin the economy. Hmm. So that was absurd, but still they were in charge. And uh, there we go. Well, they say, we've got to give them something to do that they'll transition into the general economy over a period of time. Let's send them to college. Not only that, that will increase our intellectual uh, capital in our country. Well, Pastor, what did it produce? It produced diploma mills. <laughs> we have uh, people out there that have a diploma that can't read the diploma. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, uh, you see, Walter saw all this perfectly. Tom DiLorenzo, do you know him? Yeah, I know of him. Tom's one of my real heroes, and uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy, just you know, anything that you can read by those guys <laughs> do so, they help out a great deal. Hmm. What is the, the system that you are encouraging people to employ? Uh, how should they go about learning about how to use it and how to secede from the system individually to get away from a centrally planned uh, to get away from being vulnerable to the ups and downs of a centrally planned economy? Well, I have a website, infinitebanking.org, or you can just uh, Google uh, R. Nelson Nash, the Nelson Nash Institute. Uh, the directors are Carlos Lara, a great businessman up in Nashville. Bob Murphy is the most published Austrian economist out there today. David Stearns is uh, my son-in-law, and he's our admin person, and uh, I'm the fourth uh, member. <clears throat> and we created the institute there as an educational organization. We w won't uh, let anybody go through the course until they first meet with us for about an hour to make sure that we are like minds and so forth, and our, our goals are the same. And we have practitioners all over the United States and so forth. And when you go to our site there, uh, there's a practitioner finder and so forth that all over, you know, all over the United States and Canada. <laughs> if you had five minutes with somebody to give them a strategy for preparing for uh, the next downturn in our economy, could you give us just a few points that you would say these are the things you need to have in place to prepare? It's not things, it's a message. It's just like Paul was back talking to those Corinthians back there. You've got to start the mental process. Uh, you got to get the understanding as to what's going on. And when you go to my w website, uh, there's a tab called Resources, and when you, you click it on, uh, there's the contents that drop down, and one of them is a reading list, and there's about uh, uh, 285 books on that reading list. And if you read all those, you got one PhD in Austrian economics and one PhD in history. Hmm. There are more history books than there are uh, uh, economics books because you can't uh, study history without understanding. I uh, can't understand economics, rather, without understanding history. So if somebody had their thinking right, though, what could you lay out some, some pieces that would be uh, part of a sound economic portfolio or sound economic uh, plan for weathering a storm? The best thing that they can do is uh, see all the uh, podcasts and videos and things like that that Carlos and Bob have put together and so forth that address this thing particularly, specifically. So uh, I'll, I'll just have to stop right there with that recommendation. Okay. Nelson, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Ruined your whole day, didn't I? <laughs> it was great. I, uh, it was an education, absolutely. So thank you. A joy to be with you, Pastor. As we close out this episode, I just wanted to take an opportunity and, and read you this uh, obituary of Nelson's life, a pretty incredible guy. And I just wanted to share, share with you, uh, some, some more about who he was, uh, as he's, he's gone now, uh, he's gone to be with Jesus. He's gone to meet those folks he was talking about there in the episode. He's seeing them face to face, as he said, not in the not too distant future, uh, he would get to meet them. And it was true. So Robert Nelson Nash of Birmingham, Alabama, beloved husband of Mary Edwards, Nash, 
passed away as a result of complications from heart disease on Wednesday, March 27, 2019, at the age of 88. Nelson was the son of the late Jewel Young Nash Sr. and the late Sarah Annette Whitaker Nash. He was born March 15, 1931, in Greene County, Georgia. Nelson grew up in Athens, Georgia, and graduated from the University of Georgia with a Bachelor's of Science degree in Forestry in 1952. Nelson served two years in the U.S. Air Force from 1952 to 1954 as an aerial photo interpreter with a strategic air command at March Air Force Base in California. He and Mary moved to North Carolina where he worked in forestry as a private consultant for nine years. While there, he joined the North Carolina Army National Guard as a fixed-wing pilot after attending Army Aviation School. He went on to earn Master Aviator Wings during his 30 years of military service. In 1963, he moved the family to Birmingham to continue his work as a forestry consultant. One year later, he made a career change and entered the life insurance business. During his more than 35 years of experience as a life insurance agent, Nelson worked with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the U.S. and with Guardian recognized for his high achievements. Nelson was inducted as a Hall of Fame member by Equitable, a chartered life underwriter, and the life mem- and a and life member of the Million Dollar Roundtable. In 2000, he wrote a book, Becoming Your Own Banker, which would go on to have a high impact on hundreds of thousands of people by teaching them how to create their own banking systems using dividend-paying whole life insurance. This book evolved into the infinite banking concept, and Nelson enjoyed traveling all over the U.S. and Canada to lecture on the topic as the founding director of the Nelson Nash Institute. He is also the author of Building Your Warehouse of Wealth and co-author of The Case for IBC. Nelson was a member of the First Baptist Church of Birmingham for 28 years. He had a lifelong passion for music and was a long-term choir member and frequent vocal soloist. He was a voracious reader, and he especially enjoyed studying Austrian economics and history. He also enjoyed aviation and travel, often piloting his family to destinations around North America in small aircraft. Nelson is survived by his loving wife of 66 years, Mary, and his three children, Debbie Nash Matthews of Anniston, Alabama, Dr. Barrington Nelson Nash of Knoxville, Tennessee, and Kimberly Nash Stearns and his son-in-law David, whom he mentioned, of Birmingham. He's also survived by his ten grandchildren, nine great-grandchildren, in lieu of flowers, in Nelson's memory. I want to share this with you. May uh, In Nelson's memory, donations may be made to the First Baptist Church of Birmingham. So, pretty cool. Really appreciated that opportunity to sit down with Nelson and to record this episode before his passing. Very, very much uh, counted as one of the great privileges of this this uh, venture that I've been on with the podcast and just really such a testimony of the hope that we have in Jesus there from from Nelson to say in, in just a few weeks, uh, just a, sh- a short time, I might be meeting those guys face to face and he was ready to uh, to meet Jesus. So I really appreciate this opportunity. I uh, encourage you to tune in to the next episode, episode 93 with Carlos Lara, where we're going to take this foundation that Nelson laid for us of the deep history of financial uh, difficulties in our world. And, and we're going we're gonna to take that forward into the recent history and the future and how we prepare for financial troubles created by central planning and, and central banking in our world. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to share these things with you guys. And I look forward to more episodes coming out in the near future on the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.